Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling bright and blessed, full of the love of Jesus walking in his spirit with joy in your hearts and praise upon your lips. Now we're continuing our look into the life of Job through the book of Job. And today we are going to begin chapter 20. Now it's important to note here, as I said earlier, that many of the things that Job's friends speak about are true, but mingled within that truth is some serious error. And the biggest error that they speak is when they apply the truths that they're saying to the life of Job. Even though they're true, they're not true in this particular case, in this particular circumstance. And we know that because of what Job says in chapter 21 and verse 27. He says, Behold, I know your thoughts and the devices which you wrongfully imagine against me. You see, you have said it in your hearts that I have sinned before God. And so Job is continually making his case that this is not true. Now, as I said, much of what they say holds much truth. And that's what we find in chapter 20. Because Zophar's speech to Job, I cannot myself find one problem with. So he begins in verse 2 and he says, Therefore do my thoughts cause me to answer. And for this... I make haste. So he's doing something right here, maybe for the first time. He's considering what it is he is saying. In other words, he's focused upon the fact that I'm speaking truth, therefore it must be true. But again, even though it is the truth, it doesn't apply to Job's situation. He says in verse 3, I've heard the check of my reproach. In other words, I've heard what you have to say, Job, and I am carefully considering what I'm speaking. So I've heard the check of my reproach, and the spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. So even though I've considered what it is you say, I find nothing wrong in what I am saying. He says, you know from old Job, since man was placed upon the earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. So he's saying, yes, while it is true that the wicked prosper here upon the earth, the joy and the pleasure that they gain from such wickedness is short-lived. He said, even though his excellency, man's excellency, mounts up to the heavens and his head reaches unto the clouds, yet he shall perish forever like his own dung, like his own excrement. They which have seen him shall say, where is he? He shall fly away as a dream and shall not be found. He shall be chased away as a vision of the night. Now in the next verses, he's going to continue the plight of the wicked man. But it's interesting because in verse 12, he says, Though wickedness be sweet in his mouth, and though he hide it under his tongue, though he spare it and forsake it not, but keep it still within his mouth. Now that's the interesting part. Keep it still within his mouth. The book of Revelation tells us that in the time of the tribulation, when God is pouring his wrath upon sinful mankind, they will not repent, but they will shake their fist in his face. And so this is an indication of those who are suffering in eternal torment. They won't be crying out to God for mercy, but they will still be spitting in the face of God because their wickedness has been hidden beneath their tongue. And the reason for this is mentioned beginning in verse 15. It says, he who has swallowed down riches, and he shall vomit them up again. God shall cast them out of his belly. Now, when I read this, I'm reminded of three passages. The first would be that when Jesus tells us, it's almost impossible for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven because he is consumed by his riches. The second is when Paul tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil. Man will sell his soul to gain riches upon this earth. And the third passage that comes to mind is when Jesus gives us the parable in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 16, it says, He spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. 
And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? I have no room where to bestow all my surplus, all my fruits. And so he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, and I will build greater barns. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods and hoard everything unto myself. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast laid much goods up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things shall these be, which thou hast hoarded up? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. And so what this parable is telling us is that freely as you have received, freely give. None of it belongs to you anyway. The Lord gives, as Job told us, the Lord takes away. And so it's all his. We can't think of it as our possessions. We can't think of it as our money. It's his money. And we've been given the privilege to manage his money, to manage his supplies. And so unlike the wicked, we should be looking for greater opportunity to give away all that we have rather than to hoard it unto ourselves. And that's what Zophar is speaking here when he says in verse 15, he swallowed down his riches. The wicked has swallowed down his riches. He's hoarding it for himself, but he will vomit them up again. God will cast them out of his belly. Now look at verse 19. He has oppressed and forsaken the poor. Because he is hoarding everything unto himself, he is not looking to the needs of the poor. He has oppressed and has forsaken the poor. In verse 27, it says, The heavens shall reveal his iniquity, and the earth shall rise up against him. The increase of his house shall depart, and his goods shall flow away in the day of his wrath. In the day of God's wrath, everything will flee. Naked he came into this world, naked he will leave this world. And he will stand before the Lord God Almighty naked, shameful, and guilty. But we, friends, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have been washed in his precious blood, filled with his sweet spirit, we shall stand before the Lord God Almighty clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, meaning that God will not see us, but God will see Christ, Jesus, his son, in us. And for that, we will find pardon. That is our heritage, friends, and that should bring us much celebration this day. Well, I'm so thankful that you're again here with us. I'm thankful that you're under the tutelage and the teaching of the Word of God. I pray that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to truth that you've never seen before, and this causes you to be a more faithful follower of the Lord Jesus in all that you do, all that you think, all that you say. Now, as he wills, and until tomorrow, friends, I truly love you, and I'll see you on the next video. Mm -hmm.